नमो भगवते वासुदेवाय नमो भगवते वासुदेवाय नमो भगवते वासुदेवाय रेता मुखे महाभागा महाभागा प्रणान मे हृदयात्री विद्या प्रधुरभूत अहम आसम त्रिपृन मखा रेथा मुखे महाभागा प्रणान मे हृदयात्री विद्या प्रधुर्भूत विद्या प्रधुर्भूत अहम आसम त्रिवृन मक रेथा मुखे महाभागा प्रणान मे हृदयात्री विद्या प्रधुरभूत अहम आसम त्रिपृन मक हरे कृष्ण I'm very grateful, very happy, very fortunate to be with you today. Thank you, Jaini Thai Prabhu, for giving me this opportunity to serve. Today we are reading from Srimad Bhagavatam, Canto 11. Chapter 17, entitled "Descriptions of the Varnashram System," text number 12. In this section of Shrimad Bhagavatam, Uddhava was personal cousin. and most intimate friend of krishna in all of mathura and dwarka he is in most con- most difficult challenge of his life krishna is all attractive krishna tells in bhagavad gita as we surrender unto him he reveals himself accordingly the more we surrender to krishna the more krishna reveals his all attractive qualities and in doing so completely conquers our hearts and in the process of our hearts being conquered we reciprocate Some Siddhi or Hari Toshana. Our only desire is to please Krishna. Krishna, through the love of his devotee, is conquered by that love. This is the spiritual realm. Uddhava, as Krishna's dearest friend, years before in Mathura, was asked by Krishna. 
to go to Brindaban. He told that I promised I would return to Brindaban. <coughs> and from the Brijabasi's perspective, it is long overdue. Still, I have not gone. I wish for you to go to deliver a message to give them solace. Uddhava considered he was on a very merciful mission to give Krishna's association to the Brijabhasis. But what he found when he arrived was something beyond even his imagination, beyond his conception of what love of God was. He was speaking to Krishna every day, joking with Krishna, eating with Krishna, laying down with Krishna, walking with Krishna, discussing every type of topic with Krishna. The residents of Brindaban, they were crying day and night in separation from Krishna. They were, Krish they were seeing Krishna everywhere, in their hearts, in every leaf, in every tree, in every grain of dust of Vrindavan, they could only remember Krishna. This viraha bhava, this love and separation was so deep, deeper than any ocean, higher than any sky. Uddhava witnessing the total absorption and love for Krishna with the desire to please Krishna came to a wonderful conclusion that in comparison he had no love for Krishna. Now it is material tendency in any field of life if somebody has much more than you have, especially if that's the speciality of your life to have it, and you're very well known and famous for having it. When you see somebody else having more, you could become quite depressed. Or more likely, you become jealous, envious. You try to somehow or other um, outdo that person to reclaim your, your rightful position in your own eyes, in the eyes of the world. But that consciousness is not in the heart of a true Vaishnava. We find this in Uddhava. He was famous as being the most intimate, loving friend of Krishna. The best in Dwarka, he was known as the best devotee. When he saw the Gopas, cowherd boys, how they were absorbed in remembering Krishna, crying for Krishna. Nanda Maharaj, Yashoda, the mother and father of Krishna, and all the elderly gopas and gopis. When he saw the cows, the calves, the goats, the buffaloes, the monkeys, When he saw the creepers and the grass, the leaves and the trees and the flowers, totally absorbed in remembering Krishna, longing to serve him, longing to please him. And then in Udhav Kyari, that very holy place just close to Nandagaum, Krishna met. I mean, you would have met Gopis and personally witnessed with his own eyes the love and separation of Sri Radha. <coughs> Uddhava was very happy to admit that compared to them, he had no real love for Krishna. The intimacy, the sweetness, the purity 
of the absorption of love for Krishna and the will to serve and please Krishna in the Vrajabhasis was something he had never experienced. But he didn't become envious, just the opposite. He wanted, he wanted to serve the Vrajabhasis. He wanted to follow in the footsteps of the Vrajabhasis. He didn't want to be better than them. He wanted to serve them and please them because his only motivation was to please Krishna. And if these devotees have such love for Krishna, how much Krishna will be pleased with me if I appreciate them and I serve them and I please them? This mood, this mood was of such a nature that reached such a pinnacle of perfection that Uddhav's only prayer was not to be a gopi, not to be a gopa, not even to be a kalpa briksha tree. He desired just to be a little piece of grass, gulmalata, a little plant that's growing in the ground, the Chintamani soil of Brindaban. Because then he could truly show his appreciation and he could serve. When you see somebody as being exalted spiritually, it humbles you. And that humility makes us so dear to Krishna. He desired to be, for the rest of eternity, a little piece of grass growing in the soil of Brindavan near Govardhan, so that the cows would step on him with their hooves on his head, and the calves would jump on his head with their hooves, and the gopas would step on with their lotus feet, and the gopis, maybe even Sri Radha, may someday step on his head. <laughs> and he would be so soft and so nice and so full of love and appreciation and affection, he would give them a little pleasure when they stepped on him. They would feel his love, they would feel his infinite appreciation for their service to Krishna. That was his prayer. Some people pray to become God, to become great yogis with supernatural powers, to have the wealth of the heavenly kingdoms, Nadanam na janam na sundarim kapitam vajagadisha kamaye Mama janmani janmani shwari bhavat pad bhakti rohoi tiki tvai Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu He prayed in this way I do not want wealth or power I do not want the objects of pleasure in the form of the opposite sex to enjoy. I do not want fame. I do, want, do not want great knowledge. I don't want supernatural powers or even liberation from suffering. My only prayer is to serve you unconditionally. Chaitanya Mahaprabhu also offered the prayer Gopi Bhartur Padakamalayora Das 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 Anudas. To serve Krishna is to please Krishna. And this great secret of secrets is Krishna's most pleased when we serve his devotees, when we appreciate the love, the sacrifice of his devotees. And we make great spiritual advancement by pleasing Krishna when we humble ourselves, 
with appreciation for what other devotees are doing for Krishna. And because Uddhava was Krishna's best friend of Dwarka, he was, a, he was a most intimate devotee of Dwarka. Uddhava realized, externally Krishna sent me on a mission to Vrindavan so that I could give solace to the Brijabhasis. But the reality is I couldn't even give solace to the Brijabhasis. Because when they saw me their separation from Krishna, their, the pains of separation from Krishna only increased. And now I understand those pains of separation that the residents of Vrindavan are feeling are limitlessly more intimate, sweet, and ecstatic than anything myself or any of the residents of Dwarka have ever understood. So let me be the servant of the servant and take the humblest position. When Uddhava returned to Mathura, Krishna confirmed that yes, that's why I, that's why I sent you. I wanted you to have the opportunity to see what is that love. And Uddhava, from that moment, <clears throat> his heart was to follow in the footsteps of the residents of Vrindavan in his heart of hearts, not by imitating them. by serving. Little later, Krishna moved to Dwarka, and Uddhava, his friendship with Krishna, became ever more dear. At this moment of the discussion we're reading, in the eleventh canto, Krishna had already been on this earth about 125 years. And Uddhava, he was watching, he was seeing what was about to happen. Krishna was about to leave the world. He saw how Krishna's own child, Samba, and some of his friends, they were in a playful mood. They wanted to kind of test Narada Muni, Parvat Muni, and some other great devotees. So they dressed Samba up as a pregnant lady, young girl. And they asked the sages, you are knowing what is going to come in the future. Please tell us, will this be a boy or a girl? <laughs> Such playfulness in the mood of the princes of Dwarka. And anything they say, how do you answer that? They said a boy, they said a girl. They're wrong because it was nothing there. <laughs> but the sages understood ultimately Krishna's will. By the power of Yoga Maya, these princes, they're joking with us. But Krishna wants to show how he doesn't accept offenses to his devotees, and there will always be a reaction. So the sages said, this person will give birth to a lump of metal that will be the cause of the destruction of the entire Yadu dynasty. 
so be it. <laughs> and then the sages left. That was not the answer they expected. <laughs> they expected it will be a boy <laughs> or it will be a girl, and then they would laugh, ah, it can't be either one. But suddenly, out from Samba's stomach came a lump of iron. This was an emergency. <laughs> They went to the king, Ugrasena, very secretly. What are we going to do? And Ugrasena, what are we going to do? We have to somehow or other um, compensate. This is crisis management at its, at its peak. What is the king going to do? He had nothing to do with it, but now he's responsible for everything. Hmm. Tiny type, well, you probably have these experiences <laughs> in your own small way. <clears throat> because leader is responsible for what the followers do. In one place, Srila Prabhupada writes that the guru is responsible for the um, activities of a disciple. And therefore, the true love of a disciple is not just kijai talking, but it's behaving in such a way that it, it gets people to appreciate their guru. Srila Prabhupada quotes this place where the jai and vijai made an aparad to the four kumaras at the gateway entering Vaikunda. <clears throat> and the four Kumaras were very offended. They wanted to come in and see Vishnu. And Jai and Vijay said, no, no, you are children. You're not even wearing clothes. You cannot come in. They cursed Jai and Vijay. And when that was happening, Vishnu came out. And Vishnu said, I'm responsible. My servants have acted inappropriate. I am responsible for this. And there Srila Prabhupada says, real love is to act responsibly. That is tapasya. Tapasya is to do the right thing, not just for ourselves, but as representatives of our spiritual masters, of our founder, Acharya Srila Prabhupada, of Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's mission. When we identify as a devotee, by taking this responsibility of acting appropriately in a way to please our gurus and Krishna and the Vaishnavas, that's how we make spiritual advancement because that's how we make, that's how we please Krishna. So here's Ugrasena trying to be compassionate to all the yadus, and he grinds that lump of iron into fine powder and then throws it deep into the sea. One little piece he couldn't grind down and he threw that deep in the sea. And somehow or other, by the higher power of grace, the fine particles washed up to the shore and each one grew into a stick, kind of like bamboo, but very iron hard bamboo. And that one little piece was eaten by a fish, and a fisherman caught the fish, threw the piece, and a hunter named Jara made it into an arrowhead. And if you want to know the rest, Please read Srimad <laughs> Srila Prabhupada says, devotees don't like to hear this story, so I will not subject you, although it's transcendental. So they all went to Krishna, what are we supposed to do? And Krishna says, you should all go to Prabhaskjetra and perform sacrifices there. Mm -hmm. 
<coughs> and Uddhava could see exactly what was going to happen. The Yadu dynasty <coughs> was about to leave the world and he understood that Krishna is about to leave the world. All his relatives, all his friends, all the devotees, and Krishna himself. And Krishna is telling Uddhava, you should stay here. What a crisis in his mind, what a crisis in his heart. Now Krishna is not telling him to go to Vrindavan. He's telling him to go to Badrigashram, high in the peaks of the Himalayan mountains. Krishna tells there's devotees there who never got my association. So I want you to give them your association. Give them my association. This is how Krishna is thinking of all of his devotees. He sends his intimate devotee on his behalf. So knowing what is about to come in this state of internal ecstatic crisis of imminent separation from Krishna, his dear most friend and Lord, Uddhava is asking questions. It is called Uddhava Gita. Krishna has already had his Vrindavan Leela, his Mathura Leela, he's completed his Dwarka Leela. Krishna had already spoken Bhagavad Gita to Arjuna. And now this culminating point, Uddhava's asking questions, not just for himself, but for the whole world. He's already attained the highest perfection. Here, Uddhava, in this particular chapter, is asking how the people of this world can actually attain unmotivated, uninterrupted love for you. What is the process? Only you knows fully and perfectly the process. Because the process of perfection is pleasing Krishna. In our words, our actions, our thoughts, our lives. In Kurukshetra, some years before this conversation, Krishna told Arjuna, Sarva dharman parityasya mam ekam sharanam vraja aham tvam sarva pape vyam moksha yishami masa Abandon all varieties of religion. Just surrender to me. I shall deliver you from all sinful reactions. Do not fear. But how to do that? Practically. How by the execution of one's particular duties, varnashram, one can please you, one can purify their hearts and awaken love for you. What is the process? In this, these verses that we're reading, Krishna is explaining how he descends into this world and gives a particular type of spiritual process according to the Kaladesha Patra, the time, the place, and the people. Krishna tells in Satya Yuga, everybody is sinless. Everybody that's born in Satya Yuga, practically, is born with unalloyed devotion. All they have to do is just meditate on Krishna. And it's very 
it's a challenge, but it's an easy challenge. They surrender their hearts, they surrender to lives just by remembering Krishna, meditating upon Krishna, meditating on the beautiful form of Krishna. And here, in this verse, Krishna said, talking about the next age, Treta Yuga, where not everyone has love for Krishna anymore. Not even everybody can meditate on Krishna anymore. So he's giving the, the process of yajna or sacrifice. And Krishna's going into some detail of the nature of the sacrifice, the purpose of the sacrifice, and how it is executed. Through this narration, it's very important to us because it reveals how Krishna, Ahambi Japratapita, who is our father, our mother, Suradam Sarvabhutanam, who is the dear most ever well wishing friend of every living being, but who never interferes with our independence. Love is an expression of free will. <coughs> Krishna gives every jiva, every part and parcel, free will. When Chaitanya Mahaprabhu spoke to Sanatana Goswami, he began with the premise, Jivaraswarupoy Krishna Nitya Das. We are all eternal servants of Krishna. This is very important because in order for true love, prema, to be cultivated and awakened in the heart, this must be understood, that we are eternally servants of Krishna. We're never separated from Krishna and we never become Krishna. We are eternally servants of Krishna. Mamayavam so jiva loke. Srila Prabhupada cites Nityo Nityanam Chaitanas Chaitananam Eko Bahunam Yuvadadati Kaman. There is one supreme eternal, and there is limitless eternals who are all dependent upon, subordinate to that one supreme eternal. Every part of the body is a servant of the whole body. So in this way, when we understand this principle, then our true goal of life is to please Krishna. Unconditional, unmotivated, means it's very different than being a servant in this world. Because in the servant, being a servant in this world, you want to get paid. You want to get something in return. But a hoitaki aprati hata means a servant of God is simply to give pleasure to God. I'm yours. Ashlisyava padera tampanashtumam. Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu prayed that Krishna, if you like, you can embrace me. If you like, you could trample upon me. Or you can make me broken hearted by not being present before me. You can do anything you like because I am your servant unconditionally. Bhaktivinoda Thakur and his prayers of surrender. Maro bhirako bijo icha tohar. He says, if you want Krishna, you can protect me, or if you like, you can kill me. Do anything you want, because I'm your servant unconditionally. That type of trust in Krishna's love is at the heart of bhakti. If we truly trust Krishna's love, 
then we understand. We have faith that Krishna is always with me. And if I just surrender my heart and remember him and take shelter of him, Shadarnagati, then Krishna knows what's best. Little Prahlad, when he was thrown off the highest mountains, can't even imagine. If you've seen some of these mountains in South India, where the Ugra Stamba is and Ahovalam, you go up there and you're just on this little mountain peak. You have to crawl to get up there. You look down, and it seems forever. There's no slope, it's just straight down. And it's like you're on an airplane, but there's no walls and no windows. <laughs> and you're just looking down. And then the wind starts blowing, and you are feeling very vulnerable that it, you can fall. And on our way up, I remember when I was climbing there, so many of the villagers were telling us how many people fall off and die. <laughs> it's a reality. So little Prahlad was in a mountain higher than any of these, and he was thrown off. It wasn't like, maybe I'll fall. He was thrown off. <laughs> but he trusted Krishna's love so much. He wasn't even saying, Krishna, save me. That even didn't come to his mind. It was just, Krishna, I'm yours. I know you love me. And I know you protect your devotee. So whatever is your will, I'm yours. Vajahure mana srinandanandana abhaya charanada vindare. Prahlad didn't have to deal with cellular phones. <laughs> <laughs> but even that, nothing could disturb Prahlad because he had complete faith in the love for, in Krishna's love. And throughout Srimad Bhagavatam, Bhagavad Gita, Krishna is, is manifesting through his words and his actions the nature of his love and the nature of his devotees who have trust in that love. Because Krishna's love is not about preserving this little body of ours. Because it's guaranteed in the form of time Krishna's not going to allow this body to live for very long, anybody. There's really not much difference if you think in terms of eternity. If you think in terms of Satya Yuga, where people live an average lifespan of about 100,000 years. Whether we live for 50 years or 80 years, it's not so much difference. <coughs> While we're alive, it seems to be a difference. But after you leave your body, nobody really can tell much difference. Mm -hmm. People just think about what you've done. They don't think about how long you survived. So the body is destined to be transformed. So what is it that the body has complete faith in that Krishna will protect me? It includes the body, but it's beyond the body. Little Prahlad just gave his soul to Krishna. He was fearless. 
So Krishna is coming to all living beings and he's teaching us practical method that we have the capacity to follow so that we could all enter into that state of pure devotion and surrender to Krishna. So why Krishna, Dwapa Yuga, is going to end after Krishna leaves this world and then Kali Yuga begins? Why is Krishna talking back about what happened, what he does to enlighten people in Sati Yuga and Treta Yuga? How does that apply to us? It applies to us because it gives us a glimpse into Krishna's merciful nature. According to our conditioned state, Krishna gives us a perfect opportunity to surrender. And in the future verses, Krishna Varnam Krishna. It's told that in the age of Kali, those who have good intelligence, they worship Krishna, who doesn't now have a dark complexion like a monsoon rain cloud, but appears in a different complexion. Gargamuni, at the time of the name-giving ceremony of Krishna Balaram, revealed that in Kali Yuga, Krishna appears with a golden complexion. And we worship him through Sankirtan, the congregational chanting of the holy names. Kalair dosani de raja nasti hegumahanguna kirtana deva krishna sya mukta sangha parambraje. This age of Kali is full of faults, but there's a benediction. Krishna has made it this way. Even the most sinful people, just by chanting Krishna's names, can attain the perfection of liberation. Dinahina yata chilo harinama utharilo tara sakshi jagai madhai. This is the evidential testament of this truth. The holy name of the Lord is so merciful, so pure, so all-powerful. Param Vijayate Shri Krishna Sankirtanam, the prime benediction for all humanity. The Jagayan Madhai. Compared to Jagayan Madhai, our immoral activities are insignificant. When that devotee approached Krishna, and, I mean, when that devotee approached Srila Prabhupada and said, Srila Prabhupada, I am the most fallen. Srila <coughs> Prabhupada sensed that there was some arrogance even in that. Because <laughs> false ego is so um, complete in its strategic ways of capturing us. that we could become egomaniacs thinking that we're humble and presenting ourselves to be humble. Very fine. Vaishnavism is a very, very fine, subtle, actually, truly going beyond the ego. Through surrendering ourselves to Krishna's will. This devotee said, Srila Prabhupada, I am the most fallen. Srila Prabhupada replied, you are not the most anything. <laughs> Compared to Jagai and Madhai, how fallen are we? We don't have to go into the details of what Jagai and Madhai did. But Yamaraj doesn't have an entire department keeping track of your sins or my sins. He had a whole staff trying to keep track of Jagai and Madhai. And they were working 24-hour shifts. 
and they were exhausted. Some of them were becoming suicidal <laughs> because they just couldn't keep up with it all. And it was so contaminating just to see, even for Yamadutas. But Narottam Das Thakur declares from Mahaprabhu and Nityananda Prabhu's Leela that by chanting the holy names, all those sins were cleansed. And they became pure devotees, intimate associates of the Lord. If you go to Katwa on the banks of the Ganges, even today, you can see Madhai's Samadhi, his tomb. And millions of pilgrims go there to bow down to Madhai. Why? There are so many devotees who have samadhis, so many devotees who have tombs, so many devotees who have left their bodies. Why go so far on a pilgrimage to see Madhai? Because he gives us such hope, hope in the power of the holy names of Krishna. That if we simply take shelter, And taking shelter means Srila Prabhupada in Lord Nityananda and Lord Chaitanya's mercy made it simple. Follow these four regulative principles. Lord Chaitanya and Lord Nityananda Prabhu, they told Jagai, stop all your sins, never do them again. Render seva to all the Vaishnavas and all the people in general and constantly chant the holy name and you will be forever protected in my loving service. That's all. The yajyas performed in the Treta Yuga, we're getting a little glimpse in this verse, in this purport. You really, those priests were so well trained. They had such total control of their minds. <clears throat> when they were being doing these yajyas, their minds had to be completely fixed on every mantra, on every procedure. And every syllable of every line of the stotras, the prayers, the mantras had to be perfectly recited. And if it wasn't, that means you're not sincere. <laughs> it was a test of your sincerity that you had to do everything precision. Because everyone could do it if they really were sincere to do it. But today, I don't know what you're all thinking of as I'm speaking, <laughs> but I, I have my doubts if you're in fixed concentration and your mind is not wavering to anything or anyone else but this sound vibration. So somehow or other, Treta Yuga is not the time for you. <laughs> But don't be discouraged, because Krishna is so merciful. He appears as Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu and Nityananda Prabhu in this age of Kali. And if we're just sincere, to try to chant the holy names attentively, to try to live with these moral regulative principles, and to try to really develop a mood of humility and service, Lord Nityananda's mercy coming through Srila Prabhupada compensates for whatever we lack. Srila Prabhupada humbly told us, I have made your qualification. Just take shelter of the holy names. And the final verse of Srimad Bhagavatam, it is declared that if we just chant the names of Krishna and bow down to Krishna, 
sincerely. Krishna will remove all of our sinful reactions, all of our sinful tendencies, and give us himself. So today, such a beautiful yagya we're performing, the Julan Yatra. This is Lord Chaitanya and Lord Nityananda's mercy. This is Srila Prabhupada's mercy. He has brought this culture of bhakti into our lives. In this beautiful temple of Sri Sri Radha, London, Ishwar, in the city of London, the past, the, the sweetest, most beautiful pastimes of Goloka Vrindavan are being revealed to us. It's actually unimaginable. It is important that we meditate on what Srila Prabhupada and Krishna are giving us. Because when you walk into the street just go down one flight of stairs and onto the street and right on this little block of Soho Street. What's going on? <laughs> so much greed, so much distraction, so much lust, so much envy, so much arrogance, so much illusion. It's incredible so far from Brindaban. <laughs> but yet in this little room, it is Brindaban. It's not just representing Brindaban, it is Brindaban. Srila Prabhupada, so merciful that the Goswamis, their deities, Radha Madan Mohan, Radha Govinda, Radha Gopinath, Radha Raman, Radha Gokulananda, Radha Giditari, Radha Shamsundar. Srila Prabhupada names these the first large sets of marble deities in all of Iskan, Radha London Ishwara. Mm -hmm. Now you may, for most people, London Ishwara. You think of, yeah, that means the, the Lord of London. You, know, you think of somebody dressed in royal gowns in Buckingham Palace or something. <laughs> Krishna's playing a flute. <laughs> with peacock feather in his little turban and he's standing beside Srimati Radharani. This is the Lord of London. <laughs> <coughs> and in Paris, Prabhupada named Radha Paris Ishwara. I, I think he said something like, that everyone in Paris is, all the girls are looking for handsome men and all the men are looking for pretty girls and now Radharani and Paris Ishwar have come to attract everybody to, mm -hmm. to their loving service. Something like that. <laughs> so Krishna is all attracted. And today he's enacting Jula Yatra, Swing Festival. Only between Ikadasi and Balaram Jayanti does this Jula Yatra take place in temples. Just a few days every year. It's so special. It's so rare. It's so wonderful. It's Brindavan Leela. The Swing Festival doesn't even happen in Mathura or Dwarka. 
It's only Vrindavan where Sri Radharani is on the swing with Krishna. In Vrindavan, it's only the the most the most close, intimate gopis that take place in this in swinging Radharani and Krishna. And that pastime is taking place right here in this little room in London, England, by Srila Prabhupada's grace. It's taking place all over the world in every temple. The sweet pastimes of Vrindavan. So much easier than performing Treta Yuga Yagyas. <laughs> Even little children. As far as I could see, they've all left my class <laughs> for good reasons. <laughs> but during the swing festival of Sri Sri Radha London Ishwar, they were all here and they were all smiling and swinging and dancing. So pleasing, so beautiful, so simple. The pastimes of Vrindavan are the essence of simplicity. <clears throat> I remember our dear God sister, Ladini Devi, who this Ladini is standing in the back of the temple next to the painting of Lord Balaram, is named after. But I was with her the first time she ever came to Brindaban. She lived in a place called New Brindavan and she was a pujari for Jagannath Balaram Subhadra for many, many years. She was always doing seva, never complain. Just always grateful, enthusiastic, and happy to do seva. And performed such in incredible austerities in the way she served. If there was no facilities whatsoever, she would just go out to the forest and find some way to make the facilities. You have to cook an offering with six preparations for the deities by this time, and there's nothing in the kitchen. What do you do? Some pujaris would complain why the management is not providing. It's not my fault. Some would quit, go somewhere else. Someone would just become angry, some would become discouraged. Those sentiments were not in, in the realm of consciousness of Ladini. She would go out, she would chop wood to make fire. She would, you know, just see if it was the winter and there was no plants. <laughs> she would just go out and find something and make six luscious preparations to offer to the deities. How did she do it? Because she just had that enthusiasm. She wasn't depending on external facilities. She just was there for Krishna. Here I am, and here you are, Krishna. <laughs> and this is what you're expecting of me? I will do it. She would do it. But she was always meditating on Vrindavan through hearing and chanting, through seva. In those days, we didn't have that many books. It was mostly Krishna book. <laughs> but she would read Krishna book, and she would live in Vrindavan, just remembering these stories, and, and living in the spirit of these stories in her everyday, moment-to-moment -moment life. You know, you don't read in Vrindavan about 
snow blizzards. Of course, Indra sent something like that. But Krishna was protecting everyone under Govardhan. But even in the winters of seven months under snow and ice and freezing and hardly any heat, she would be reading Krishna book and living in Vrindavan. <laughs> and serving Balaram, Subhadra, Jagannath, and Krishna in the mood of the residents of Vrindavan. And I remember years and years the day she finally came to Vrindavan in India. We were going around to different places. And I remember we were in a simple place on a little hill in Vrindavan. Prajabhasis were around. And she was crying, weeping tears of joy and appreciation. And I'll never forget what she said. Do I have time to tell? <laughs> she was remembering Uddhava's visit to Vrindavan. And she was appreciating how when Uddhava saw the residents of Vrindavan, he appreciated the total simplicity of the love and devotion of the Prajabhasis. Just so simple. They're making garlands. <laughs> and Srila Prabhupada sometimes explains simplicity as no duplicity. Just three days ago, I was walking with some devotees who are here now. We were walking through a pasture, someplace a distance from here. And we saw sheep eating grass. And it really looked beautiful, maybe about 30 or 40 sheep just eating grass. And they were so absorbed in eating that grass. They weren't fighting with each other over the grass. They were just eating grass. I was thinking, it's so simple. Just, just give them grass and they're happy. <laughs> It's enough grass. They don't have to fight about grass. <laughs> but we have so much complications in our mind. In Kali Yuga, the tendency for quarrel and hypocrisy is so strong. It's permeating the atmosphere. So much fighting for no good reason at all. In this material world, there's really no good reason at all to fight about anything. You know, fighting over countries. Sarv Sarvaloka Maheshwaram, it's all Krishna's property. We're all going to die, Srila Prabhupada says, if you're from one country and fighting against another country because you're thinking about them so much in your next life, you're going to probably be born, you're likely to be born in the other country. <laughs> And then all the preparations that you're making to defend your country will be used against you in your next life. <laughs> so fighting, husbands and wives fighting, brothers and sisters and brothers and brothers and sisters and sisters fighting and friends getting in fighting and god brothers and god sisters getting in fighting and religions fighting. So much fighting on every level. There's battles of egos, acquisition of property, this uh, 
Janasya Moho Yamaha Meti. I am this body, I am all the things in relation to this body. I'm man, I'm woman, I'm a British, I'm American, I'm Indian, I'm from this particular egoistic identity, and you're from another. And whatever's in relation is mine. Bhagavatam says this is the basis of illusion. And here are the sheep. They're not fighting. Sheep don't fight too much. <laughs> Even at our Govardhan Eco Village, we have sheep. And I see that other animals, they have a tendency to fight more than sheep. Sheep just kind of eat their grass. <laughs> and I was thinking, um, Srila Prabhupada said that Krishna consciousness is simple living and high thinking. Unless you have simple thinking, you can't have, unless you have simple living, you cannot have high thinking. And simple living doesn't mean that we just sit around eating grass. <laughs> You know, you could be a CEO of a major international corporation. You could be the Parikshit Maharaj was king of the world. But he had simple living. Because he was satisfied with the simplest things. <clears throat> Eating grass, is, they're, they're happy doing that. Prabhupada said a devotee, we are happy with one or two japatis and sleeping under a tree if we can chant the holy names. We don't need anything else. But yet he told devotees from America, build a temple in Vrindavan, Krishna Balaram temple. And for any of you from the West who try to get anything done in India, you know how complicated it is nothing works. <laughs> At least not the way we're accustomed. Everything has, like people driving, here you put on the brake. In India, they, the same reflex, they press the horn. It's just a different way of surviving. <laughs> so the devotee, he saw these Brijabhasis, you know, just Jai Shri Radhe, and he said to Prabhupada, he was a sannyasi too, he said, Prabhupada, I want to do this Jai Shri Radhe, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm constantly fighting against people who are trying to cheat us and trying to keep the steel from being stolen by people, and it's so complicated in getting the permits and all the bureaucracy to get the permits and all the, everything is so difficult. Prabhupada defines simple living is you do it. <laughs> Build a temple. <laughs> and go through all the aggravations and all the difficulties and all the challenges and all the apparent failures. Keep do it. Don't give up. He said, work now, samadhi later. <laughs> <laughs> but the simple living is you're just doing it for Krishna. No ulterior motives. Just doing it for Krishna. Krishna, I'm yours. In this mood, we chant the holy names. That's simple living. So Ladini saw the Brijabhasis and felt the atmosphere, and she was saying, Now I understand what Uddhava was saying, mm. that the people of Vrindavan are just so simple. They just love Krishna. Mm. That's all. <clears throat> and here we're seeing today, greater than all the yagyas of Treta Yuga, all the magnificent forms of meditation in Satya Yuga. The elaborate pujas they worked, they, they offered in Dwapa Yuga. Hmm. 
more special, more complete, more intimate than all of them. It's just pulling that little string to swing Sri Sri Radha Lundadishwar for their Julan Yatra while chanting the holy names. So simple. And some of you are working and you have families and there's so many implications, complications in human relationships and somehow or other getting done what you need to get done. Somehow or other dealing with this world around us and all the traffic and all the pollution internally, externally. There's a lot of traffic in the people of, in people's minds. Mm -hmm. Yes, if you, think, if you think there's traffic jams on the roads, just look into your own mind and see what kind of traffic jams there are and see how many horns are blowing, mm -hmm. how many sirens are going off. <laughs> but let your mind just come back to the reality that Srila Prabhupada has given us, the supreme reality. Radharani and Lananishwar are happily seated on their swing as the devotees are singing and dancing. And that's our happiness. So simple. Patram pushpam palam toyam. If we offer Krishna a little leaf, flower, fruit, or water with devotion, Krishna's happy. So it's very special we come here during Julian Yatra to participate, and we're reminded of the beauty and the simplicity of Lord Chaitanya's gift. Vrindavan, mm -hmm. right here in this wonderful little building on Soho Street, in Bhaktivedanta Manor, for us to realize Hare Krishna. Hare. Thank you very much. Srila Prabhupada Ki Govind Swadhanath Maharaj Ki Jai! Does anyone have any questions? Any questions? Any Thank you very much Maharaj for a very inspiring class and reminding the devotees that this is Vrindavan, um, right here in this temple with Radha Madhanishwar. But my question is that Srila Prabhupada has also instructed us to worship Radha and Krishna in the mood of Lakshmi Narayana. So is there some contradiction there, or how do we, um, how do we deal with that instruction and in going into this more uh, sweet, esoteric mood of actually the simplicity of the Vajabhaktas. Hadi Hadi. <laughs> Srila Prabhupada established the Julian Yatra festival for us, the Govardhan Puja festival for us, the Sarat Purnima festival for us. So we're worshipping Sri Sri Radha, Lananishwa, Radha Govinda, Radha Gokulananda. But we are worshipping them according to the um, according to rules, regulations and principles. Srila Prabhupada told the deity worship most important things are cleanliness and punctuality. And there are various aparads or offenses we could commit if we're negligent in our deity worship. Because although there were, we're worshiping Sri Vrindavaneshwari, 
the Queen of Brindavan and Sri Rasaraj Krishna, the Lord of Brindavan, Brindavan Bihari. We are worshipping them not in spontaneous love because we haven't achieved that spontaneous love that hasn't been given to us. And even the Goswami, Sanatan Goswami, Gopal Bhatta Goswami, they gave us the Hari Bhakti Vilas, which is telling how to worship the deities according to very, very um, carefully um, crafted regulative principles. So that, that worship with careful directives of how to do is categorized as worship of Lakshmi Narayan. So we're worshiping Sri Sri Radha Krishna, but we're doing it with these regulative principles, with these rules, with these procedures, which gives the, the, the form of the worship the form that is offered of in Vaikuntha to Lakshmi Narayan. There's awe and there's reverence. But in our hearts, we're hearing the pastimes of Krishna. <laughs> we're in Vrindavan, but we're approaching it with, with the dignity and the humility of of how we are actually very undeserving to be there. And therefore, in our humility, we very, very carefully follow the rules and regulations of our puja. We cannot imitate the residents of Vrindavan. When we hear the pastimes of Vrindavan, we understand that the dignity and the elevated realizations of the Vrajabhasis are practically infinitely above our heads. We humbly bow down, aspire for that, and we follow the directions that Srila Prabhupada has given us. So, in essence, yes, we are in Vrindavan, but we are approaching Vrindavan in a very realistic and humble and dignified way, according to our position. And Srila Prabhupada himself and our great Acharyas and the Goswamis, they taught by their example how to follow these principles. Six, six. Raghunath Das Goswami, he would chant two lakhs of the names of Krishna every day. He would offer so many thousands of prostrate obeisances to the devotees every day. He was practically only eating a pound full of buttermilk sometimes every day. Srinivas Acharya tells how the devotees uh, and, uh, they were sleeping under trees. Now they're the intimate associates. The manjaris of Sri Brajbhumi have descended to this world. In the Srimad Bhagavatam, you don't see gopis living like that. <laughs> they're just dancing and singing. <laughs> So the six Goswamis are the, of the most elevated standard of devotion, and yet they're chanting the rounds so many more than us strictly every day. They're honoring and worshiping Vaishnavas so strictly every day. They're transcending their urges from even material maintenance of eating and sleeping so strictly every day. And when they're doing puja to the deities, they're writing volumes of 
books of how to worship the deities. And Rupa Goswami and the Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu tell so many ways of approaching the deities and serving the deities. What to avoid, what we're supposed to do. They're not only writing, but this is the way they're doing. Narottam Das Thakur writes that if we want to enter into Vrindavan, we must follow in the footsteps of the six Goswamis. And Srila Prabhupada would love to sing that song, Rupa Raghu Nathapadeh. So this is the dignity, this is the humility, that we must strictly follow these principles. And then, Srila Prabhupada said to devotees, because you're practicing Krishna consciousness like this, you're already liberated. You just haven't realized it. So we're engaged in the liberate, we're engaged today in the liberated activities of Vrindavan, swinging Sri Sri Radha Govinda today. It's incredible, unbelievable, all merciful. But we haven't really realized it. But by following the path, Vaidhi Bhakti, approaching Raga Bhakti through Vaidhi Bhakti, then we gradually realize where we are and what Srila Prabhupada has given us. I hope that answers your question. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Maharaj, for your enlightening class. You were mentioning how the um, gopis were seen Krishna everywhere in Vrindavan. In uh, Bhagavad Gita, chapter 7, um, Krishna says we can, that he is, um, uh, he is the light of the sun and, uh, and the moon and the taste of water, these things are wicked. Now he says, I am, I am the light of the sun. Now it's summertime, you see people sunbathing a lot, they're getting a lot of association with Krishna, how come they're not being... How come they're not becoming more and more Krishna conscious? <laughs> I guess we should be asked the question, how come I'm not becoming Krishna? <laughs> We're always thinking of it as everybody else's shortcoming. We have to recognize our own shortcoming. You see, Bhagavad Gita begins by teaching us how to feel Krishna's presence through knowledge. It's an adjustment of how we actually perceive the world. When we see the sun, we adjust our consciousness. Krishna tells, and whatever Krishna is saying is the absolute truth. Krishna is saying, I am the sun. I am the light of the sun and the moon. I am the taste of water. I'm the fragrance of the earth. I'm the seed of all life. I'm the ability of man. I'm the intelligence of the intelligence. There's nothing left. <laughs> when Krishna says, I'm the seed of all life, everything is emanating from me. Aham Sadhavasya Prabhupada, all spiritual and material worlds are emanating from me. Krishna's everything, Krishna's everywhere. So we adjust our thinking in this way. And then we understand how we're reminded of Krishna. But through this process of purification, and most of all, in order to understand all this, Nam Nama Karu Bahuta Nidra Krishna is not different than his name. And if we could recognize Krishna in his name, then Krishna will actually reveal himself in everything else. And as our as the 
cloud of illusion. Because as far as I could see here in London, you don't see the sun all that much like you're saying. <laughs> At least it's mostly clouds. <laughs> So when this cloud of illusion is evaporated by the process of pure devotion, of bhakti, then we don't have to intellectually adjust our thinking on the level of jnana or knowledge. Then it's spontaneous. We feel Krishna everywhere. We experience Krishna everywhere. When Madhavendra Puri would see a cloud, he would fall unconscious because it reminded him of Krishna's complexion. When the gopis were searching for Krishna and he left them during Ras Lila, he, they were in their search for Krishna, they were seeing Krishna everywhere. They were asking the trees, they were asking the moon, they were asking the birds, they were asking the leaves and the shrubs. Have you seen Sri Nandanandana? Where has he gone? They're talking to the deers. Everything was reminding them of Krishna and their moods of separation. That's the highest platform of love. We're not on that highest platform of love. But Krishna's bringing us there because <clears throat> by remembering Krishna, we become purified. Oma pavitra pavitra va. Krishna's all pure. So by remembering, yes, here's the sun. Krishna says, I'm the light of the sun. We remember. By learning to see everything as, Krishna, everything as Krishna's energy in every situation as an opportunity to remember Krishna and serve Krishna, we gradually become purified. And as we get purified, we're attracted to Krishna in everything. Thank you very much. Thank you different stages. It's like if you're sick and a physician tells you <clears throat> that eat this food, it's good for you. Then you recognize I should eat this food because it's good for me. And that's very important, having that knowledge. But then you have to eat the food. Mm -hmm. Knowledge without application of the knowledge never leads to realization. So Krishna's revealing how he's in how he's everywhere in this world, how he could be remembered through his energies. And it's very simple how to apply that principle. In every situation, Krishna, I'm your servant. How may I serve you? How may I be the servant of your servant? And you've come to you've come to bless my heart through your holy name. So when we see the sun, the light of the sun, we say Hare Krishna <laughs> to reciprocate with Krishna. We see the moon, we say Hare Krishna. <laughs> we see the ability in somebody, we say Hare Krishna. We smell the fragrance of the earth. <coughs> it may be a sweet flower. It may be sewage. <laughs> we say, Hare Krishna. <laughs> <laughs> Hare Krishna. <laughs> Thank you very much.